because the upsurge has been sort of so vast and to, to see all of those images on the news uh, was so distressing, you know, um, you know, the various images of um, overflow of people in the hospital wards um, who can't get beds, can't get treatment. That has been uh, really distressing. Of course, we have do have family relatives, um, you know, in India, uh, both in Mumbai in the city, but also in the village uh, of our ancestral place, which is called Ratnagiri, uh, which is the western coast of India, um, and that, of course, we, we do get the news, and we've been checking in every now and again with you know with family and friends and um, mostly everybody is isolating and, and doing their best to to, to stay well um, but we have had some relatives that we have known about who have passed away with Covid and of course that's always a sad thing so I'm always trying to review my relationship with India and my um, connections to this place of my ancestral heritage um, yet somehow it feels so much more personal you are listening to Maharashtra Matter a frontier media podcast hosted by myself João Paulo Simões and engineered by Ricardo Lourinho in conversation with Uzma Kazi on the subject of our connection to a distant motherland At the point of the recording of this, the India variant has become the dominant variant in the UK, with numbers growing exponentially, and we are 15 days away from finding out what the government is going to do. So um, a thing that strikes most people with a good sense is that a lot of the decisions in most countries, but since we're here we'll talk about what affects us directly, a lot of the decisions are made with a um, political mindset, with political priorities. And that was the same with um, how things were handled to begin with in uh, Maharashtra. And I wanted to talk to you, Uzma, about that because um, it's no secret that um, an election was still run when, when this was starting and becoming what, 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 what's become, really. And it has contributed to, in numbers and in uh, infections, um, school teachers were forced to go to work because the school would be a poll station and then they would go home and they infect, they would infect relatives and, inf and relatives would die. So you don't need a, a clearer example than, than that. So I, I just wanted to hear your opinion on, on, on that side of it and perhaps we can talk a bit more of how things are over here as well. I guess um, I feel that India, in a general sense, is becoming a more and more polarised place um, for different communities, different faith communities. Um, and I feel that the political landscape has a lot to do with that and has always had a lot to do with that. We can reflect on the here and now with COVID happening in front of us. Um, and the fact that rallies continue to happen, the fact that uh, various religious gatherings and festivals continue to happen, and in effect what has led to this second surge of COVID in India, um, is I think really telling of a neglectful it's almost a you know a neglectful leader in power and i feel that you know um because of this polarization really um the people who are well off and rich will continue to be okay they'll be looked after they'll have the best hospitals yeah. they will get the best care um, they will be able to isolate well. They will also probably be able to have a funeral with dignity. They'll be able to manage that well. They will be validated. 
but the majority of Indians citizens I feel will not um I've been following um Arundhati Roy who's a writer and novelist uh, who speaks a lot um about the political spectrum in India and she wrote um a, an article um in which she there was a quote um we are witnessing a crime against humanity and i think it really speaks volumes because the leader that they have in india right now uses the narrative of faith and religion to polarize communities against each other um which means that for people to survive and and thrive in india will always have that political backdrop and and some will be more privileged than others because of that yeah because of the the images that reaches paint a picture that is very striking in the sense that we see the the ones that are most affected being in some ways the obvious ones the ones that you would expect to be the most affected but in a way that is totally inhumane nothing was put in place and nothing was being put in place for a long time and correct me and uh, please inform me further but from what i know Ma- maharashtra is one of the most industrialized states or it's the most industrialized state probably in in india isn't it there's a big inequality because of the contrast between the privileged and the ones that are not even accounted for because if if you take into account all those villages along the ganges and all that they they there are people that are born there that are not even registered so so they so they're not even a number that can be accounted for if they die of covid so so the whole idea that uh that we're actually witnessing a catastrophe but only a fraction of a catastrophe is very apparent so yeah i mean it's um and what you're saying about um the neglect i think that there i mean there's the, it's the political interest that that perhaps can you can draw a parallel and and a, a definite connection with how it goes on here everything is the result of something else and and serves an interest of somebody else always so even in the way that uh, borders were never properly closed in time at any point during this pandemic over here when it came to this new strain the science was all there the information was all there other countries around india were already being put in the red list and and india was not and why was that because boris was expecting to go there to sign a trade deal and why the why was it so important to sign a trade deal because of brexit so everything can be traced back to something else and uh and in this case something that had that impact over there has been brought over here now it's the dominant here you know it's not a stretch of the imagination to think that it's self-harm um you know i've been thinking about this so much um in bradford where i'm from um in bradford where i live um the we have recently had um a couple of clinics have recently um opened for walk-in vaccination uh, for people particularly the older age groups who may not have had uh their vaccinations um to make it easy for them um to to just walk in and and get a vac- vaccine i think that it's almost like global politics kind of colliding and capitalizing in this really fragile time for humanity yet business still continues and of course to some degree business does need to continue um however um at what cost i think that the border should have absolutely been closed much earlier i know that there are various um cities uh, across the uk that are absolutely on high alert because of their um high indian population or indian heritage population um and I can't help but feel as if as though you know this idea of neglect and not actually putting the right things into place at the right time sometimes one does think has that been done on purpose yeah it's it's a for, it's definitely it's a definite form of neglect because I think that that's kind of like that lack of initiative to properly go around informing people not just over here but it's certainly over there they perhaps more striking 
but then there's the talk that certain communities the, the there's more hesitancy towards vaccination than others and uh, i was wondering what do you really think about the bame term because i have some thoughts and um, you may want to say something first <laughs> oh where shall we start with this one um well um this term bame stands for black asian minority ethnic communities and it was a term that was created as a way to control people of color at that time we didn't have this term people of color but suddenly it feels that we are actually having to reconsider our identity with politics and kind of unbox ourselves not be um categorized by these terms which have been put on us and in my work as a community development worker um you know a lot of my work has been about engaging people from my community and uh, communities i should say um and we've often had to go with that term because that is just what stuck and one of the questions i'm asking myself at the moment and also asking of communities is how do you want to define yourself because um this word bame or this this term bame is something that was put on us yeah so how what do you think about it how do you you know i'm trying to find an alternative what what i worry about is that what i think is has happened is that um because this term bame has been there for so long people have gotten used to it so there's some kind of a compliance um a kind of a going with the system and perhaps this is unconscious so there's a lot of consciousness raising work that i feel has happened and we you know we see these conversations happening more and more when things like black lives matter has arisen or or various things are happen you know happen in 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 the world um and i think those kinds of things make us have to um think think about where we are where we stand what we believe in how we want to be defined and be firm about that um so but i i feel that there's still a lot of work to do and it needs to be both within our communities and us speaking with compassion within our communities but also for the i'm going to say non bame communities <laughs> <laughs> for the non bame communities um to really be a part of those conversations yeah i think it's in some way it's up to the communities to speak up about how they feel about it because in this day and age there's never any any problem with people from all walks of life and all sorts of orientations or racial background to speak about how certain terms really make certain people feel so so there's a big is it is it is a big kind of like awakening in in that sense but but that in itself still carries an underlying need to categorize to to identify and categorize and then defend the ground of uh, and I'm now I'm talking beyond race you know but that's kind of like the age we we live in it's uh uh the age of opinion protection of rights uh, but also of uh fighting your identity and often fighting your identity is finding your completely no no offense meant but finding your label that's kind of like how it comes across um and i think british culture and british government historically it's very prone to categorization of groups of 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 um of movements i don't i'm not saying that there's always something nefarious behind it but i i'm, I'm but it's definitely in in cases like this of the bame community and the labeling of the bame community community and the bundling of such different communities into one categorization uh i think i mean you can't there's no escape that it's the whole point of it is racial even if you 
put Muslim mixed in, you know, it's it's still about race in terms of who in general is of a Muslim faith. So, um, so if it is racial motivated, I think it's up to the communities to say if they feel it's racist. I, I agree. I think that there is something about, like I say, that consciousness raising and I feel that as a collective, um, we are moving in, in an unconscious way, progressing forward. But how many of us are, are able to question and critique this idea of BAME? You know, how, how many of us actually do see ourselves as that? And I feel that it's really complex. I th so there's something about generational change and maybe there's some kind of progressiveness that's happening. Mm. And I think these shifts in thinking, like BLM, for example, when things like that come about, I think forces us to question our place in the world or where we have been put in the world and where we want to be in the world. What is our standpoint? Um, I think, I feel, I, I just feel that there's so much work to do. And and also I feel that it's it's life work. It's, it will continue, we'll, we'll always continue to do this throughout our lives. And maybe by then, maybe there is a normalization of terms. Um, when I think generationally about what I see within my own family, sometimes um, when I speak to my nieces and nephews, for example, and we have this discussion about our sense of home and belonging, and, you know, I grew up um, speaking Marathi or Gokni, which is the dialect of, um, of Marathi that my family speaks. I, I grew up speaking and understanding Marathi because we spoke with my grandmother, and my parents, but my nieces and nephews, they don't speak. They haven't had the opportunities to do that so much. And so they don't. And so every now and again, I think we we try and like, we do, we do have these discussions. And um, it's interesting how each of us defines what we think a sense of home and belonging is. And for my grandma, who who sadly is not not around anymore, but um, I think she'd have a very interesting concept of what home is for her, and she would action it in a way that is um, like, for example, sending money um, as an act of charity to people in India because. That is her. That for her, that is home. That is where she started. That is, that is her people. That is her home. To people like my generation, or for for me, there's a little bit of both because for me, there's something really important about ho holding on to a sense of there's something wider than just the here and now and the present of me b living and growing up in Britain. There's a there's a history. There are histories that are behind us. So there's something that I do absolutely hold on to, even if I haven't really lived in India. I can't deny that there is an absolute, um, you know, an inkling and a softness and a connection to that place. Um, to then thinking about the younger generations whose mind it doesn't even cross, you mm. know. Um, and, um, so it's interesting. There's a, there's a variety of opinions and thoughts around. Yeah, but they all kind of hinge on that idea of, um, where you came from, uh, that idea of, you know, you were born here, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. But, but you came from there. You, <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's, um, it's all, it's all hinges on that, uh, that notion of motherland and, um, motherland as in mother nurturing. So I, I was wondering how, throughout your life, those values that you just described, 
that you nurture still and that you that were put onto you and that form the identity of your family how how, how 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 much at odds do you feel that they are with the uh, with the surrounding culture with the british culture that has its own values and its own strengths and its own uh, noble values let's say but uh, but uh, it's very different and it's and and uh, i was wondering if if at all you feel like you feel so integrated that that doesn't come into your mind or 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 do you feel there's got to be at some points in your life that you feel um the difference oh that's a big loaded question <laughs> well um me and my sisters we often sit together and um we reflect on this idea of our family our culture our rituals that we have our food our all of these things that are just second nature to us you know and we always always go back to my grandfather because of him we are here now you know all of them years ago in the 1950s he is the one who sat down somewhere in the village and decided that he was going to get up and come to england and he was going to come for a better life and and all of that um and you know we were just thinking about what was that thinking process that he must have been going through and the kind of life that we live now we have actually as a society and generally um we have access to so many privileges you know the privilege to hop on a train or hop on a plane so i think it's really really important to acknowledge um you know the generations who came here before us mm. and i have this really funny thing where the 1st of january every year i put a little post out on instagram which says um happy birthday and it's a it's a little um basically a lot of the south asians who migrated to england in the 50s 60s and so on a lot of them were made to change their birth uh their birth dates or their birth years to be able to easily um come to the UK um and as a result many people of that generation have two birthdays in the year <laughs> and um a lot of them will have a birthday somewhere in January <laughs> um so i like to do this little thing where i put a a, <laughs> a post out saying happy birthday to the people in my grandparents generation we are here because of you you know and thank you <laughs> because of you we are able to actually reap the fruits of what we have now um i do feel somewhere that it's important to um you know in some way it feels like there's a duty to put back in and to ensure that we can nurture and validate and take note of the journeys the trauma the difficult survival story that probably they all have Do you know for me there's a real privilege of having a dual heritage identity um because there's the opportunity to make the best of both um the wisdom of both the fruits of both etc um but one can come at the cost of another and i really feel that there have been many occasions in my life where i've found that the two have really been a friction not that you should want to fit in i get not that i've wanted to fit in i've just wanted to be me authentically in every situation that i go to but there is no denying that having a heritage which is not british has at times been exoticized mm. and that's really frustrating because you're trying to reconcile all of the the ease and the wisdom but also some of the really hard stuff i've then also had to manage this british identity and sometimes that has come at a cost of my indian heritage Um it's interesting because when I go to India 
I have been called a Britisher <laughs> and that comes off the back of that colonial legacy of the empire and uh, the British Raj and all of that. And it's interesting because it works the other way around because in Britain, it's almost like you are diverse because you have something else that is not British, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so so it's great in lots of ways, but it's also a whole set of negotiation, a whole set of trying to reconcile that perhaps if you haven't got a dual heritage in that sense that you may not have to do. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I hear you going into such detail and nuance about your experience like this, and I I think about my own, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know where to start in a way, but uh, I, but I, I could also it could also go back to my grandfather. He left when he was a child when he got his education in in the north of Portugal, and he lived away from his family for many years as a child, and then he went back to Angola, and he was high achiever. And some people may know he's, he was a poet, and even though his poetry spoke of a of a, an independent Angola before any other poetry of the time and during. Uh, Portuguese colonial rule of Angola, which got him into trouble. Um, even though he was writing about the pride that you should take on being uh, an Angolan, first and foremost, and not a subject to Portugal, he, he always had a sense uh, of duty and an ethic that wasn't always replicated by the people around him on both sides, on, on the side of the Portuguese sometimes, and on the side of the Angolans that would work as well. So um, it took a war, a colonial war, and then a civil war, to for my grandfather to leave. And then he was in Portugal. And when, while he was in Portugal, he, was, he found out from a safe source that uh, his arrest had been arranged for the week after the date that he left. And in those days, being arrested would be to disappear completely, you know, because uh, he was already being considered a traitor because his poetry was uh, being embraced. But as he saw what was being done in the name of his poetry, so to speak, was something that he didn't want to have anything to do with. He could already tell. So he was considered a traitor to his own initial call <laughs> of independence. Um, and he lived for the rest of his life in uh, in in Portugal. So when I when I said that it all, it also goes back to a grandfather, it's like that because then we all he was such a strong figure. So we all sort of congregated around his knowledge and around his cooking, around his and around his um, spirit, and um, in the surrounding culture of that I that that I, that I was growing up in. In Portugal, I was, I you know, all my friends from school and all that. There would be less a sen that sense of communion and the way that communion was expressed uh, in the simplest things. That was always there to mark a difference, which would only become apparent if people would see someone from my family or my mother would pick me up from school or whatever. Because the way I look, I don't look very different from that guy over there that's recording us. So in a way, I've been um, a target. I would never, I would never call myself a victim because it's not about being a victim. But I've been a target of sort of like delayed racism or delayed uh, racist reactions because I wouldn't look particularly different from anyone else. But then they would see that I, in their view, I was. So people that would even be friends up to that point would find a way to point it out or to or to express it, or to use it in the moment that they felt like they could, really. And then, on top of it, <laughs> I uh, I came to England. Then I became something else. I, I didn't become someone from a mixed background necessarily. I just became a foreigner and someone that can't be identified very quickly as something else, but that people can tell is something else. So, um, and that in itself has its own set of challenges because then it becomes about how comfortable people are 
in the face of something they don't understand and usually they're they're not very comfortable so can i ask you a question because you know you've talked about your grandfather's spirit and that feels really really precious when you come up against these racist situations or when you find yourself being you know a f- at a front with these things mm. um do you have a process that helps you reconcile these things what does that look like um that's a very good question because i think one of the ways is not to give it as much importance as or not to be on a constant state of outrage otherwise you don't do anything and you don't accomplish anything so you have to learn to step over it you know it's in the way and you step over it or you dodge it and you carry on that way you avoid conflict with someone who could never possibly understand you or where you come from so it's very it can be very tricky to be facing animosity and potential danger from someone ignorant because ignorance can lead to to proper trouble <laughs> um, if, if as soon as you are as soon as you're informed you question and you reason and you can even if you don't agree or like something you can find some moral core in yourself to not to do something or say something no matter how you actually feel about it or you intellectually approach an issue it's interesting you say that because i wonder if sometimes for example going back to the reference of bame whether we can pigeonhole ourselves and often i wonder i want to be able to move forward and for example produce a piece of theater work which does has no reference to my um heritage or that i won't be seen as a woman of color doing that piece of work but just that i will be seen as uzma and that that will be enough i guess the hope the hopeful me um thinks that 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 is absolutely possible and is it that i have to shift my framing of how i see it um you know let's face it um the funding streams are set up for us to apply for work this word diversity before diversity we had multiculturalism mm. um we had all these narratives about you know people from bame backgrounds don't integrate um what can we do to bring people out and all so this control mechanism i feel will always be there and perhaps there's something freeing about letting go of the term and embracing the human being that will enable me and us to tell our stories just for what they are um and i that really excites me yeah i know that personally you've gone or you're going or you've recently gone through a period of acknowledgement of the role of your faith in your life in in, in what you want to communicate and express um but um i i i it's interesting because i've aspired to something like that and then and because of in my own in my own field as a filmmaker i never thought i was making portuguese films but my films are always recognized as portuguese by portuguese people that says something about that connection to a motherland because i was born in angola i left when i was 1 so i grew up in portugal they didn't go back to angola until i was in my mid 30s and only once so Uh, my formative years are portuguese and that's what i identify myself mostly as at some point one of my films was screened at uh, at the portuguese film archives and the director of the film archives watched it with me uh, it was a special screening almost just for him really so we sat in a big sort of theater almost just the two of us and he watched it and he said that it had a, a very specific characteristic that is that portuguese filmmakers that are away from portugal they leave portugal for their own reasons and they think they're leaving portugal behind but they remain secretly in love with portugal and i think that, that there was a lot of truth in that and i never thought about that i just you know i just do what i do and um my point i suppose is that you you aspire 
to do to be able to do something particularly to be able properly able be allowed as in to come up with a project that is viable for you to make without the constraints or the labels put on or or the only path to take is uh, putting your arm up in the air and going, ah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm diverse, please <laughs> give me some money. Um, and, um, but the truth of the matter is that it will, it will be there because it's part of your identity, of your DNA, really. It's so pertinent what you've said because I recently completed like 10 years in my fields of work, um, design, uh, theatre performance related work and youth and community work and you know you get to these sort of moments and you think okay what have I actually done in these last 10 years and where am I going and what does it all mean am I still creating work about the things that I set out to do mm. I think my artistic self always goes back to the 16 year old Uzma in the art room in school because that is where I was allowed or not just allowed but I had the space there weren't any rules you know you could do what you wanted mm. um, but it's where I felt most at home and so some days I'd go to the art room and I'd just draw a thing and it I didn't know what it was and it was okay that I didn't know what it was it was just true for that moment. I didn't really have these words or labels for my work at that point. It, I was just really enjoying being curious about the world. And um, it was brilliant because I used to go home from school and look at the encyclopedias that my dad used to have on his shelf. And I used to look up India. And then there was this word colonialism. It was sort of an all-encompassing journey and process that I that didn't really have any marking points it just happened and I really feel that if there could be moments like that that I could return to it would cut out the the sort of political vocabulary mm. and the political systems which makes it really hard to make work that you're passionate about and that is speaks to your soul and I think as an artist cr to create work that speaks to your soul I think is such a beautiful thing. It's a process that I think most most artists would recognize is that um, the work that you do through time and the way your body of work comes together and comes about it's almost like it assimilates what's put on to it by 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 exterior and external forces and, and opinions or or the way it was made possible through whatever funding or whatever so that shaping of your artistic expression will always if you think and if you are conscientious and if you think about what you're doing and you take it seriously you know that you need to unlearn a lot you need there's a lot that you need to shed and to, to because it, it bec from a certain point is to when you start you want to gain experience and once you gain experience you want to go back to that point that you didn't have the experience because you were freer so to, and you and whatever would come out of you would, would be purer uh less polluted um so um that in itself even though it's a very individual personal thing and it's expressed completely in individual terms from person to person from artist to artist i think that's somewhere along that process that i mean trying to form or that identity again in, in your mind and to f trying to identify it and to materialize it in some way i think that's when the idea of where you were or where you came from starts seeping through and that's when uh, the relevance of a, of a motherland uh, becomes apparent again this is a moment that we are registering and recording i suppose for the pros pros prosperity <laughs> that we're trying to go back to that place and is it a place that we've been to is it that we is it a place that we identify as homeland as our motherland or is it a, is it really about family is it beyond family 
In my case, as I said earlier, um, I was born in Luanda, Angola, but only when I went back, things made sense on a profound level uh, for me. I wrote about this in an article a few years ago. Given the opportunity at some point to be sufficiently removed from Luanda and being able to be looking over onto the cityscape, the the outline of the city across the waters, at a certain point I felt that it suddenly everything made sense and that my life made a lot more sense. Because most of the time I never really felt like I belonged in Portugal. And not that I felt that I belonged in Angola while I was there either, but suddenly certain things, how I been able to fight certain things in my life or uh, my reaction to certain things in my life, my choices of themes to explore in my films, the way they are explored, looking at that cityscape, just the the sound of it that was chaotic and joyous at the same time and dangerous. Suddenly all the darkness and all the extremes of my work were made sense even though no one ever prescribed that to me, ever told me, look, this is what's going on, where it came from, so get on with making films that express that. And that, and in fact, I never made films that specifically express that, but the energy and the choices made are very, very much informed on a genetic level, nearly, <laughs> by that. Yeah, um... I, well, I've been to India many times, but it was a specific trip that I did in 2015, which was the most awakening for me. Um, it was actually a trip that had taken me 10 years to do. We travelled around the country, um, but we only had three months, so there's only so much we could do. Um, and um, we started in the north and slowly made our way down about seven hours south from Mumbai and maybe around four hours north from Goa is a place called Ratnagiri and this is the place on the western coast of Maharashtra where the Alfonso mangoes come from, I have to add here, <laughs> um, which are in season now. <laughs> there was something about going there after 20 years which was really, really heartening. Um, I went to visit um, two different houses, one of them which actually has now been knocked down to make way for a highway to be built, um, which was is where my grandfather um, and, and, and his family stayed, um, but also another house in the village, which as a child I remember going there and so there were so many kind of significant visual images that came back to me as a child when I visited. And I think the thing that I mostly, mostly remember is the vividness of the, the colour of the soil. It's like a red terracotta kind of colour. And I remember getting out of the car that we were in and looking down and thinking, oh, I could have almost maybe took a little jar and brought some soil home with me and just kept it for the... Hmm. And maybe there's some kind of romantic notion that I maybe have about this, but I think it's actually something beyond that. I think it's something about being in the footsteps of my grandfather, of our ancestors, of really having an understanding that this is where actually I come from this is I was born in Bradford <laughs> I've lived here in Britain but actually we are from there <laughs>